Good morning, everybody. So I had a whole presentation mapped out, slides everything, about the future of housing and how Altero can address the housing crisis. But I threw it out last night based on two inspirational uh, conversations yesterday. Uh, the first was in one of the breakouts, and Vicki Robinson, one of the fellows and minister for the environment, really laid down the challenge and said, okay, we have all these great ideas, we have all this inspiration, what do we do? What do we do? On this last day of New Frontiers, how do we take this energy, this spirit of inspiration, of connection, and how do we earth it? How do we ground it into being? And the second conversation was after dinner with Robin Kermode at our house, and she said, Brian, it just wouldn't be New Frontiers if you didn't rap. <laughs> and who am I to get in the way of tradition? So in that spirit, I hope y'all ready to go, because I'm ready to float and blow like a volcano. Y'all ain't even ready to know. Got so much excitement and so many good feelings as we're here today at New Frontiers, New Zealand. With all these bright minds coming together, merging in a conscious co-creation, elevation way beyond the ordinary into the realms of the imagination. Got artists, engineers, entrepreneurs, investors, activists, all at the top of the game, saying we're the ones we've been waiting for to create and inspire the change as we rise to the call of a world in crisis where fear and disempowerment spread contagious like a virus. Divided, we are tiny, so the time has come now for our uniting. Aligning and inspiring, all it takes is our deciding. So let's build the more beautiful world that our hearts know is possible. Let's stay grounded in the practical, but transcend beyond the logical. Tap into emotional and spiritual connections, intuitive feminine perceptions. What's next is our ascension, only if we walk the path with pure intentions. From the cities and the suburbs to way out on the farms, we all must answer this peaceful call to arms because like it or not, the big shift is happening. It's moving like an earthquake beneath our feet because collectively we decide what our future shall be. So be thoughtful and reflective, but please do not be passive. Said, wake up, stand up. It's time now to get active. Peace. Ah, oh, silliness. <laughs> Switching back to the nerd glasses. Um, so, the title of today's, I, you know, basically, as I said, I really shifted things around. So, to, today I'm just going to really um, take you on kind of like a virtual tour of, of our home. Um, uh, many of you, can you get a quick raise of hands? Who's staying in, in the valley right now? All right, so a lot of you. Who's feeling good about it? Good. <laughs> All right, um, so EHF uh, really came out, you know, it was really a seed that was planted at a New Frontiers event several years ago, and New Frontiers was an event that really came out of the land. It was an experience where we were bringing people from all around the world to have an experience in a regenerative natural environment. And I really think it's important to start from that because I firmly believe in the power of emergence and that the insights and uh, realizations which uh, really underpin the EHF community are largely based in the physical proximity where it has been happening, which is why it's such a privilege to bring this event back to Upper Hutt uh, after a brief hiatus to Waiuku. 
So my journey to this land uh, starts a bit with my brother Matthew. This was back when, uh, before the beard, and, uh, and this was about 12 years ago. Um, we started a company called Inflection, doing uh, big data technology work, software in Silicon Valley. And we really were experimenting. It started in a notion of experiments. Uh, finding what worked to solve big problems. We had some ideas about some problems people were having, getting reliable access to government information, and we were sort of experimenting and finding our way. And the first few things we did didn't work. The first few experiments weren't exactly what people needed. And then we finally, through iteration, found something that worked. And from there, it was, it was a really amazing ride and a quick rocket ship. So we went from just the two of us hacking away together on, I was sitting on his, uh, uh, what do you call it, like um, a dresser as my desk. And, uh, and then just a couple of years later, uh, we had rapidly growing company. Uh, we were able to, you know, we scaled it up to over 200 employees um, across the U.S. and Europe. And then in 2012, well, we sold a big chunk of that business, uh, which was very lucrative. Um, and having then spent my early 20s in the business community trying to, to make the money, uh, and then having, you know, being the dog who catches his tail, uh, I said, okay, well, well now what? Uh, I made some money, but what does that mean? That's not fulfillment. That's not meaning. That's not, and, and the stories that society had told me about what was going to make me happy and what was going to make me feel fulfilled, I had first person and, you know, proof that they, were, they weren't true. And that wasn't enough. And so I started looking out and trying to understand how I could use my, my energy and my capacity uh, for good. And it wasn't hard to find a whole bunch of problems that needed addressing. Whether it be climate change, social issues, the war. This is right after 2008, so the great financial crisis was still fresh in the minds. The firm belief in the, the inevitability of peak oil and the issues there. And for a period of time, I got really depressed. Because all these uh, interconnected problems uh, seemed like they needed just a whole systems change. And that seems so big. How are we going to have global systems change? Uh, but then I thought back and I said, well, I would have never thought that we could create a business of the scale that we did. But it started one step at a time. It started with small actions, learning, iterating, and repeating that process. Finding what works and slowly scaling it up. So we moved to New Zealand, um, and we bought a farm. Uh, we bought this farm. This is the map. Um, and well, I loved what one of the fellows said yesterday. Is you can tell where it's man-made because there's straight lines. Uh, and nature doesn't have straight lines. There's a beautiful river that runs through this valley. And over to the left is the, the box that says, you. that's where we're at right now. So, so the farm is literally just over the hill. And it's a mixture of different things. It's, it's a combination of sort of a pine forest, a radiata pine, monoculture radiata pine. Um, it was originally a dairy farm. And there's a large uh, aspect of native forests, uh, which is actually most of, of the land. Uh, and then there's very much a, a community center uh, where people are. And so this was uh, a major undertaking to basically say that this was going to be the place where we would develop uh, prototypes for an alternative way of rural living and sustainable agriculture um, by doing, by actually taking action, uh, and by learning from all of those who have come before and all the great wisdom uh, of people who have done it, but now bringing that ancient knowledge into the future, integrating it not just with the land and with the people, but also with the modern structures of business and commerce. And so some of the issues that uh, I was really drawn to focus on uh, we're around housing, um, the human habitat relationship, how we relate to our natural environment. The term regenerative agriculture has been thrown around a lot, so I put it in the slides. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, really the, the, the initial goal at the very first New Frontiers, the challenge that I, I set forth for, for ourselves was that uh, Aroha Valley Farms was going to be a carbon negative farm, a negative, not just less bad, that the farm itself would be a conduit to sequester carbon out of the, the atmosphere. And we'll talk a little bit about that uh, later. 
Uh, and then very much about the people. Uh, I grew up in a rural community, and I, I saw firsthand how shifting trends have really hollowed out uh, rural community, and it made it really hard. Somebody talked about farmer suicides, and, and that's a real thing. Um, so it was something that, uh, you know, we can't heal the land without healing the people who live on the land. So naturally, with this grandiose ambition, the first thing we did was we came and we built toilets. Uh, composting toilets, to be precise. Uh, this was the Rolls-Royce model of composting toilets. Uh, and, you know, we learned a lot. This was a lot of fun. Uh, and it was, it, it, it was necessary to host New Frontiers, because, uh, you know. Um, and, uh, but it's also great, because it takes a waste product, uh, what we also think of sewage or waste, uh, and, you know, creates it into humanure, as we call it, which is actually a valuable product uh, in, in farming ecosystems. Uh, it also gave us some experience in recycled materials. The urinal in the right-hand picture on the left side, it's actually an old barbecue bottle cut in half. So instead of buying eight new porcelain basins that have to be manufactured, shipped across the planet, and then eventually disposed of, we actually got paid to get rid of these barbecue bottles, cut them off with an arc welder, and then we have a fully functional urinal. And the concepts of recycled materials really grabbed my attention. This was really fun. So after the bathrooms, we jumped into pallet furniture, built a bunch of pallet chairs, uh, pallet beds. Uh, I sort of got a base level understanding of carpentry from, from Sam, who was uh, my teacher in that. And this is my wonderful wife, Catelyn, who's on her throne. Uh, <laughs> uh, we also re recycled pallet bed, um, raised garden beds. Uh, really simple, you tack some pallet beds together, uh, you throw some, some you know, good soil in there, and, and it's a great environment for growing food. Uh, we also just got a lot of fun, like, all right, I need a desk. Okay, well, you know, we found, we got some, uh, some old surplus uh, cubicles uh, from a company, and uh, for free, and then we slapped them on some of the hay bales, and this is a to totally functional desk, and it doesn't require any new consumption. So rather than going down to the warehouse and buying some imported, newly cut wood, uh, this just makes use of what we already have. So these are all just sort of learning experiments that ultimately taught me one of the key lessons, that trash is a resource. And it's a really valuable resource. Uh, in the prep for this, we had you know, all the tents that we bought. We bought 75 new tents, 110 new beds. So there's an enormous amount of material. And it all came in packaging. And I was, I was so upset. I was like, oh my gosh, look at all this plastic waste. We had trailers full of it. And then uh, somebody, I think it was David, I said, well, we also need 10 bean bags. I go, oh, no, polystyrene, it's going to kill us. I hate polystyrene, and poly bean bags need so much of it. And then they connected. We can take the waste plastic wrappers, stuff them in the bean bags, and use that as the stuffing. So we were able to sequester 2,000 liters of plastic waste, get no new polystyrene, and then we had bean bags for the welcome week. So. And actually, funnily, by the end, we were actually, we ran out of plastic. And then we were upset that we didn't have enough plastic to fill the bean bags. <laughs> so this also speaks, you know, we, we do this in our interiors, but uh, another great project that just wrapped up um, that my new friends uh, led, uh, we took some uh, degraded showers uh, from a past New Frontiers. In terms of uh, one of the builders that we work with said, uh, these things aren't worth a match. Um, the, it's going to be too much effort to move it or reframe it or, or use it. Uh, you're really just better to bulldoze it and get rid of it. And this is what it looks like now. And just through the application of skills, almost no new materials were used. Uh, Damien and Bernard uh, did some amazing work to transition into a beautiful space that we call the Zen Den. Another experiment that we're running is around alternative architecture. This dome, which has been the, the home dome, uh, for all the New Frontiers events uh, was actually, we purchased it off the Christchurch Earthquake F uh, Recovery Authority, and this was actually the very first building that was set up after the major Christchurch earthquake. And it has uh, been a great home for us in all of our events, and domes are awesome. Uh, domes hold a beautiful space interior. So this was the Welcome Week uh, photo, and this was uh, my brother Tom giving the world's most glamorous health and safety briefing. <laughs> and uh, domes are also awesome because they're just uh, architecturally brilliant. Um, and this is, you know, we don't see a lot of domes in New Zealand, but it really surprises me because they're really, really good for earthquakes. 
Uh, they're very efficient materially, and they also create, um, they're really good for wind, and they're cheap. Uh, per, per square foot, it's a much more affordable way to create structure uh, than squares. So this is the greenhouse, we call it the grow dome. Uh, interior, it is a, a beautiful and lush environment uh, where we grow all kinds of good stuff using appropriate technologies. So geothermal heating, which is basically just a tube that goes underground and uses the, the thermal mass of the earth. So this allows us to grow Kumra uh, in Whiteman's Valley, which people said was impossible. Even more so, we grow bananas and ginger and turmeric in Whiteman's Valley, which people really said was impossible. Uh, but the most important thing that's growing in the valley is Laureen. <laughs> Laureen looks after the greenhouse and is sort of our permaculture uh, um, gardener on staff, and uh, she grows all the wonderful veggies that, uh, that several families uh, you know, rely on. So, but it's not all domes. We've also been experimenting with container buildings. This is kind of a fad. It's in vogue these days, people building out of shipping containers. So this arrived four days before our event because the cyclone de delayed the, uh, the boat as it was coming in. But fortunately, we were able to take it from flat pack to two fully functioning shower units with four units each in just four days, uh, which including insulation, power, water, um, lighting, et cetera. And we learned a lot through this experience. I probably won't build a lot with containers in the future. We learned a lot of the challenges, um, the issues that are there. Basically, if you don't have to change the shape, maybe it's OK. But there's a lot of toxicity uh, in these containers that really have to be careful of. I didn't know that, and I was really excited about it. And at one point, I was like, oh, let's build a container hotel with 35 containers. We're going to do this whole thing. And, and then Catelyn was the wise one, and she said, well, maybe let's start with two. <laughs> Listen. So overall, this is the EHF village. Uh, most of you are staying here, but for those of you who aren't, uh, these tents are really great. They're tensile engineering, so there's very little material used. It's really just one strong pole and a bunch of fabric. Tensile engineering is another great form of architecture that's not often employed in New Zealand. So zooming out to the farm operation more broadly, uh, in efforts to become carbon negative, uh, we do a lot of biochar production. This is taking the waste uh, green waste material from forestry and turning it into sequestered carbon. We can put this back into the soil as part of our composting efforts. So this is a way that we can take stuff that would normally biodegrade and evaporate as carbon into the atmosphere, turn it into biochar, put it back into the soil, sequester it. It also helps with nutrients and microbe life. Most important carbon engine in our farm is the cows. Um, the way that you manage cows uh, has a huge impact. Uh, New Zealand doesn't have to you know, go to zero cows to start sequestering carbon in the soil. Um, in the US, there's a, a famous person named Alan Savory who leads a lot of rotational grazing expertise. There's a lot of that in New Zealand as well. Um, this is something that's super practical. Just the way that we rotate our herds can have a huge impact on how the soil can, can take the carbon from the, the manure. So we very much uh, embrace this. We don't have any metrics to track it, but we just know it's a good thing, so we do it. Uh, and then uh, as part of the partnership with government, riparian planting to just plant the waterways, don't have the cows walk through the river and poop. It's just common sense. Um, brief plug for the family business. Uh, this is Catlin's solar energy uh, invention. Uh, she's the founder and CEO of this company. And uh, it's amazing. It's a big mirror bowl. It focuses light, and it gets really fast, cooks faster than a gas grill. Um, laser cutters, chainsaws. Uh, and uh, as I was talking about community, you know, it's, it's important that we don't just get totally sucked into the function of things. Art and beauty is a big part of what we're doing. Um, this is Matthew's garage, uh, which is awesome. Um, tents and trees. And then I just wanted to briefly plug, like, land stewardship. This is Ian Muir. Uh, he's the man who, yeah, <laughs> give it up for Ian, he's a legend. Okay, so lots more experiments to come, including some new building sites that, uh, that are fresh that we'll be doing more stuff. So quickly, one minute left, we have five key lessons that I just wanted to end with. Uh, one is that innovation requires experimentation. Nobody knows all the answers right away. We have to test and iterate, but unfortunately systems level stuff is really hard. This is part of the co-papa of, of the EHF community. Building communities, not developments. We just simply must rethink how we build our homes and how we build housing and stop thinking of it as a profit maximization exercise and start recognizing that people aren't isolated individual units. 
that communities are the level of, of magnitude that we need to be thinking about our infrastructure. Break the supply chains that bind us. Uh, this might be a little controversial to some things in New Zealand, but there's, there's a monopoly on supply chains here. It, it reduces the quality of the product, radically increases the cost, um, and there are better ways. Alibaba.com, check it out. <laughs> and then um, I'm at my time, but this speaks to what Nigel was talking about yesterday. Uh, to scale farming innovation, we must have regional solutions. Uh, there's a reason that Fonterra is so powerful here. No dairy farms would be able to be viable if they had to have their own milk processing facilities on site. But as we're doing you know, biodynamic farming, we have to basically go from seed to plate uh, just on our farm. And it's extraordinarily expensive and hard to do. It would be great if there were regional facilities where we could bring our walnuts, for example, or chestnuts. They're really sharp and spiky. Where do we take them? But right now, we have to do it all by hand. But it would be a lot easier if there were regional facilities that could process the food um, for many, many farmers on sort of a cooperative model. And I think this is where uh, the future of biodynamic farming in New Zealand will go, because we have to have the economics of scale to compete commercially. Uh, but it's just so hard to do it as an individual farm. Even at you know, what would be considered a mid-sized farm in New Zealand, like for us, we're just way too small um, and without going to monoculture. And then have fun. Life is short. Enjoy it. Uh, we'll be having a breakout session after this. Um, uh, or excuse me, not after this, this afternoon. Uh, probably at 2.30, maybe at 3.30, check the board. And we'll be talking a little bit more about what we're doing and uh, really keen to get perspectives of how we can use the space, uh, especially as an education facility, to uh, spread the good news. All right. Thank you.